Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True. And I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Dr. Paul Conti. Dr. Conti is a graduate of Stanford University School of Medicine. He completed his psychiatry training at Stanford and at Harvard, where he was appointed chief resident and then served on the medical faculty at Harvard before moving to Portland, Oregon and founding Pacific Premier Group, which has an office in both Portland and New York City. Dr. Conti serves patients and clients throughout the United States and internationally, and which sounds true, has released a new book called Trauma, The Invisible Epidemic, How Trauma Works and How We Can Heal From It, with a foreword by Lady Gaga. Dr. Paul Conti is an incredibly humble person, and he's also a person on a mission. His mission to sound the alarm that trauma is an invisible epidemic that we all face, and how knowing this can dramatically further our healing in profound ways, both individually and collectively. Here's my conversation with the very warm and insightful Dr. Paul Conti. Great to be with you, Paul, and thank you for making the time for this. Thank you. You're very welcome, and thank you for having me. To begin with, by way of introduction, can you let our listeners know a bit about your early life, your upbringing, and how you decided that psychiatry was going to become your profession? Sure. Well, I was born and raised outside of Trenton, New Jersey, and uh, it was of a normal middle-class family environment. I was fortunate that early on in my life, there were not major traumas, so it was a relatively normal and uh, distress-free upbringing in a lot of ways. Um, I went to college. I got a job in business. I, I, I thought I kind of had a lot of things figured out of what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. Um, But there was always a drive in me that was about people. You know, I was a political science major and I was interested in the people who were driving political events. You know, my focus on history or religion studies or even math kind of all came through that lens. And I realized when I was out of school, it was a four or five year mark and I had a career in business that, that it was nothing negative about what I was doing, but it wasn't as intensely person driven. As, as I wanted it to be. And there were also a lot of older people in my family that were getting, they were getting sick and, and it was scary and mysterious. And I just wanted to understand and know more. And that's what led me to go back to school. I took all the pre-med classes. I didn't have any pre-med or anything like that. And I, I went and I did it and I, uh, I went to medical school. And, and partway through, I realized that, oh, look, you, you can like really be a doctor and you can know things about medical science and neuroscience and, and you can kind of integrate that with like regular life knowledge, you know, like travel and reading and all the things that were of so much interest to me and that you could have that come through a lens of really looking at, a, at like specific people and, and you could come to know them and make a difference in their lives. And, and, and that's what really clicked for me. Like, oh, I can do all that. And then it answered a lot of questions for me of like what it was going to do that was going to really make me feel a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement. And then what brought you to focus on trauma and for that to be the subject of your book, Trauma, the Invisible Epidemic? Why trauma? 
Well, I started out as a general psychiatrist and, and I learned things, right? I mean, I saw so many patients when I was a resident, as all residents do, because we're in training, right? And then with my transition to being out in the world and practicing, I learned things I didn't know before. So one of the things I learned was how important substances were, right? Alcohol and drugs, it's such a high percentage of people I was taking care of had these had this problem. And, and I realized I'm not going to really be able to help them, right, without understanding this problem. And it led me down a, a road of doing a lot of substance treatment. But as time evolved and my practice branched out in a lot of different ways, including a lot of consulting work too, what I came to see was that trauma was underlying the vast majority of problems in myself and in other people. And those problems could come through a certain lens, like maybe depression or maybe panic attacks or maybe alcohol abuse. But underneath, so much of it was trauma. And it really just presented itself to me as like, hey, this is the common factor of most of what you're doing and most of the problems in your own life. And, and that's what then really captivated me and had me start to think and learn a lot more about trauma and then ultimately to want to, to, want to write about it. You, you call the book Trauma the Invisible Epidemic. And at first when I saw that subtitle, I was like, I don't know if I know exactly what that means. And then I started reading the book and I started understanding what you were really trying to point to. And you write that trauma operates in secret. And it seems to me, and I, and I want to check this out with you, that part of what you're doing with trauma, the invisible epidemic, is taking something that's invisible and trying to make it visible for all of us. Right. So I, I want to see if that's true. And if so, why you thought this move of taking something that's invisible and making it visible is so important. Right. I, I would relate it to, like, I remember being a kid and like realizing like, oh, like air is something, right? It's not that there's nothing between me and the, the, the next thing I'm looking at, right? And like what that is matters, right? Like if it's healthy or if it's unhealthy, like I'm breathing it in and out of me, right? It's what I'm living in. And, and I would make that, that parallel to trauma, that, that it, it's invisible in a sense, like the air is invisible, but it's all around us and it's pervading in and out of it and we're impacting it. And, and it is an epidemic in that there's so much trauma and it's so widespread on individual levels and on societal levels. And even before the recent pandemic, this idea of trauma as, a, as an epidemic was, was there in my mind because I thought, well, this is, it's everywhere, but it, it kind of gets away without being noticed, right? Like unhealthy air, if people aren't aware to test the quality of it, like you don't know, they're like, that's not good for me. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for the people I love. It's not healthy as I try and guide my life forward. So the combination of it being invisible, just often not seen and understood and being so pervasive is what, what led ultimately to that title. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to uh, bring myself forward here a little bit because, you know, as I was reading the book and I was understanding really this, I mean, you, you say that my purpose is to sound the alarm about trauma. You write trauma is a problem for each and every one of us. What I started feeling more and more is how much invisible trauma there is in my life, yes. not necessarily in my own biography, but yes, also in my own biography mm -hmm. and also in, in the people that are in my family, my partner, my friends. And, you know, I got to be honest with you, Paul, it freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> Huh, <laughs> just to say it just right that I don't know if uh, you've gotten any other feedback mm -hmm. like that from sensitive people reading the book but it's like oh wow this thing I didn't even know it was impacting so much right. of uh actions how we think our physiology now I can point to it and go oh that's trauma. So you wanted to bring this to people's awareness. How yes. is it that you think this increase in awareness will lead necessarily to an increase in healing? I think the increase in awareness, when it tells us like, there's a, there is a problem here that is common across us, right? And if you think about the problems we have as being a more and more fractured and separated society, right? The idea that we, we share we share a common problem 
right? Which is trauma in all of our lives. Like I don't view myself as, as a guy who thought of something and then like made an angle. Like let's see the world from this angle, right? But but I view myself as a person who who saw the obviousness of what's right in front of me. It is how pervasive trauma is and how much it impacts people in inside of themselves. You know, people I would see who before trauma thought that I'm a good person, I'm hardworking. I can I can have a good job and and I can have a good partner and sure. And then after trauma, they think very differently and they don't know it. They don't know that they thought differently before. When they say, "Oh, no one will ever treat me well. I'll never have a good relationship. I'm never going to I'm never going to be happy." But like a person didn't think this of themselves in, in before this, right? So this idea that when we look into ourselves, we can see how the trauma may have changed us. Right from seeing ourselves as a good person who can navigate the world to seeing ourselves as maybe a person who can't quite make it in a hostile world, right? And then when we look at the interconnection between us, we see like, well, how does that affect somebody else who who maybe is really hesitant to live up to their own expectations of themselves, right? Or hesitant to take some some reasonable chance, you know, that could make their life better, right? And, and when we start to see that, I think it creates an urgency to do something about it. Like this isn't esoteric and distant, right? It, it is tearing our society apart, whether it's through the lens of response to the pandemic and response to vaccination, whether it's through racial injustice and systemic racism or an undermining of faith, even in our economic foundation. Like it's, it's from individual people changing how they think about themselves without knowing it to the, the giant social issues that, that we really are at risk of them tearing us apart. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions that came up for me thinking about trauma, because, you know, now so many authors are submitting books to Sounds True about trauma. It is the uh, discourse of our time. And uh -huh. I started thinking, is there more trauma now than there used to be? Or are we just understanding it better now? Meaning when we think back, you know, war, starvation, poverty, abuse, I mean, these are not new things right. in our collective right. life. And I, I was curious to know your view of this invisible epidemic. Have we always had it? Sure. I think we have always had it, um, but there are differences in the, in the modern world that I think lend a different complexion to the problem that, that, um, that really makes it worse, right? So on the one hand, yes, there always has been trauma and trauma first started being recognized through through wartime problems, right? After the Second World War, when enough people were called quote unquote shell shock, right? Someone then had to pay attention to that. Like something is different in them, right? So the conception of trauma has grew up around military trauma, which then extrapolated at some point to really acute trauma, like being attacked, right? Something very bad happened. Right. So we gained an increased awareness, but even that increased awareness has not been around chronic trauma, right? Like the chronic trauma of prejudice or stigmatization, right? Or vicarious trauma. How thank goodness that most people are empathically attuned to like feel someone else's pain and potentially be kind to them, right? But we also feel other people's suffering, right? So so we've had an increased awareness, but not nearly enough of, of an increased awareness. And I think that comes out in the, in the conversations in the book, right, about, you know, the, the sociological aspects of trauma and the fact that we know now that trauma can impact children who are not born yet because of the impact, say, upon the mother. I mean, that would have been considered crazy to say not that long ago. I mean, that person is traumatized now. And that's going to change the genetics that that become operative, right, operational in someone who may not be born for 10 years. But like this is true, right? We know this is true. So so a big part of it is greater recognition, which still falls far short of the problems around us. And I think the second aspect is that social media and there's the broad ability to contact and interact with people that were nowhere that aren't around us, right? Has has had has, I, I think, um, I would say a shockingly negative impact, right? That it's not that, oh, dissemin the information disseminates more, so people can more know right from wrong. It's that the loudest voices, which are often coming from the most traumatized, angriest people, right? Because not everyone who has trauma 
kind of you know goes into themselves and doesn't take care of themselves sometimes people get get very aggressive right towards others and they want to find the reasons for their own traumas they want to blame others and and then we have like these lightning rods for anger and frustration that are divorced from truth and we we thereby bring a new route of trauma you know being able to access people and and hurt them even though they're in you know allegedly the comfort of their own homes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. The subtitle of the book, How Trauma Works and How We Can Heal It. Let's start with this first half, How Trauma Works. And I want to ask you a question about this. What's your understanding about how two or many people could experience the same thing and some person could be traumatized by it, but maybe someone else isn't traumatized by it or isn't traumatized by it very much? What does that tell us about how trauma works? Sure. Well, the first thing it tells us is that we're, we're each individual, unique human beings, which might seem like, oh, I'm saying the obvious, right? But our healthcare system, certainly in mental health, often wants to think exactly the opposite of that, right? It doesn't want to think that, for example, you and I are different people, right? We've had different experiences. So something that might kind of just pass through you and you don't think much about might strike a chord in me, right? Because because we're different, right? Or it may be that five or six difficult things have happened recently to you, but not to me. So you're prime for that next thing to have a deep impact on you and I'm not, right? I mean, these are differences between human beings, right? And some of it is like the multiple hit hypothesis, which says over time, more and more trauma, the accumulation can 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 predispose us to start to have a post-trauma syndrome at the next trauma, right? So we're different people. We have different coping skills. We have different life experiences. You know, maybe one of us wakes up well rested and the other wakes, you know, wakes up after a bad night of sleep, right? So so some of it is is the, just the nuances of individual people. And some of it actually anchors to the neuroscience of how much trauma has a person had, how genetically susceptible or protected are they? So there's the idiosyncrasies of, of real people in their real lives. And then there's also the way that the neuroscience of it plays out on, on these big levels around when changes happen in us, how those changes happen, when we have, say, reflexive shame, right, among the greatest poison of trauma, right, the reflexive shame. How does that work in a person? How strong is it? How much does a person distance themselves from good things if they feel reflexive shame. It's so much of it is because we are individuals and things affect us differently, even though there might be some commonality, something really terrible, you know, might affect all of us, right? But something that's less than the worst trauma we can imagine is going to sit differently with us and it's going to trigger different biological and psychological mechanisms within each of us. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by reflexive shame versus garden variety shame? So, so the idea is that shame is what gets called an affect, which, which technically is it's a very deep level of feeling something, right? And what we, we talk about the, the limbic system, which is really kind of the emotion system, but there are different levels of how that works. And there, there are there are affects that, that that they happen reflexively in us. So, so for example, if you think you're home alone at night and then you hear a door close, right? Like there's, that's that's immediate fear, right? Because there's not a choice. We don't think about it, right? It's reflexive, right? Because it's designed to protect us, right? To feel afraid, so that then you and all those systems of fight or flight come online, right? Well, the same thing happens in trauma. That when we are traumatized, the vast majority. I mean. It may be that every single time, we don't know for sure, but I would say every time I've ever seen, when when a person suffers trauma, there is some reflex that makes us feel ashamed of that. As if we're targeted, if something is wrong with us or we're bad. How many times have I seen people, especially when I was doing work in emergency rooms, who would come after being assaulted, like they're walking down the street, and someone attacks them, and they come in feeling, oh, it was my fault, and you know, bad things always happen to me and I wore the wrong thing or whatever a person is saying. It's a, it's a reflex that makes the shame and then we back map a story to it, right? And that's why shame is is so 
it, it is so, it, the word I would use is pernicious, right? It's so bad. It's so far reaching because we often don't question that reflex. Right? Even in my own book, I, I write about my brother's suicide, right? And, and absolutely, I carried forward with me. Like, well, I must be, I'm a bad person, right? I mean, if I weren't, I would have known he wasn't doing well, right? I, I would have been able to do something more. Like, I absolutely felt a sense of shame about it. And I felt it immediately and pervasively. And unless we go look at that, what is it that I feel ashamed about? Because look, there are things we think it might make sense to feel ashamed about, right? You know, we stealing candy from babies, right? Okay, we should feel ashamed, right? But in most cases, the shame that we feel is reflexive because something bad has happened to us. And we don't know what to do with the shame that just gets created in us. And we apply it to ourselves. I mean, I've seen it over and over and over. Uh, you know, in mentioning your brother's suicide, and you write about it beautifully in the book and the shame you experienced, uh, how were you able, knowing everything you know, to work with your own shame in that situation and find some level of resolution if you have? You know, I was very fortunate. I mean, very, very fortunate. When I look back on where that could have gone, I see where it does go for a lot of people. I mean, I'm one of these people who I, I think it's it's not a platitude, but it's it's true. It's a reflection of truth to see people who are in very bad situations and to think that there but for the grace of God go I, right? Because we all have vulnerabilities and susceptibilities. And if I were not fortunate to have really good, supportive people around me who were emphasizing to me that that they felt compassion for me, right? And that I was not a bad person and I could have a good life and I, I, I could get help, right? I, and, I, and I did. I went and I saw a therapist and the therapist helped me understand some of what was going on in me. I was lucky that I had enough knowledge and resources to get myself some help and good people around me who told me, right, it makes sense to do that, right? Don't just drink yourself to death because of this, right? Don't just decide that you're worth nothing and stop trying to achieve anything because of this. But it was far from obvious. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i a pretty perseverant person, and I think that stood in my favor, that I was very miserable and despairing at times, but I kind of kept forging forward. So I was fortunate to have that character trait, but then I was fortunate to have good people around me, personally and professionally, who helped me. Otherwise, I absolutely don't think I would have come through that in a way that, that let me go on and, and like achieve some things in life and do things that I think help other people, like the kind, the kind of things that make me feel good about myself and my life and allow me to establish a romantic relationship and a marriage and children. You know, I wouldn't have been able to do this without getting through it intact enough. And that was only through the grace of other people. So someone's listening to this, and, and believe me, this was um, my experience reading the book. I started feeling into traumatic experiences in my own life and the self-blame and shame that came up and have realized that, uh, like you just described, whatever healing has happened has happened through the love, kindness, generosity of others. And the privilege that I have in my life to have reached out and gotten some really good therapy over the years. Yes. What else? What else helps someone as they're listening and they're like, you know, I do have a lot of shame about that thing. And I don't know why I'm blaming myself. I shouldn't be blaming myself, but I am. And I have been for years and it has debilitated me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The things that we can do that don't require resources and, and sometimes don't even require other people to be helpful to us. Like, so, so an example, it is good to talk to someone, right? A trusted other person because our brains just kind of function differently. If we put things into words, we know someone is listening, but people at, at times have gotten gained a lot through just being reflective of like, wait, let me think about that. Right? Like if I say, I know I blame myself, like that's a big statement, right? Like, what does that mean? Right? Like you can, can one put that into words? Like, I know I blame myself after so-and-so died unexpectedly, or I know I blame myself after so-and-so hurt me, right? Like, and it's like, well, okay, let's think about that. Like, what did that change in me, right? What could it change to, to look at that in a, a differently? Like the idea of a true life narrative, right? That would say, and sometimes people will say, right, I realize there absolutely is someone who should be ashamed, and it's not me right? Say it's the person who hurt me, right? Or it's the society 
in which I grew up and was stigmatized as being less than because what there's something different about me from from what society says the norm is right and people can in a sense take back their own right because people aren't born thinking that they're less than right in general it is experiences that that make us think that right and if we go back and question that do I think anyone is less than someone else or they can't have a good life or they don't deserve to strive for a good life because what they were discriminated against or they were raped or they were beaten up or whatever awful thing has happened like don't we want to feel compassion for that person and, and help that person anchor to what's true about me that i knew before trauma right it's a lot easier to assess this with acute trauma because people's feelings change right if it's chronic trauma or vicarious trauma it's harder but it's not impossible i've said to people what did you think about yourself you know back in middle school or high school when like if I remember right you were getting straight A's and you're on the sports team and like you thought you were going to do this this and this like you told me that right like what's changed from then to now when you're telling you're not worth anything and you couldn't stop drinking if you tried or like what what's different and 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 we can we can do that with another person but we can do that within ourselves like what's going on inside of me that's changed me in ways that I don't recognize right unless I think about it or write about it like that's just that's one way of of you know that's free and can be done in ourselves because we're, we're then applying ourselves to the sort of scrutiny of like what's really true and what's not mm -hmm. and am i persecuting myself because of things that aren't true mm -hmm. now you mentioned paul that you're a perseverant person a determined person driven person whatever i mean you can see you've accomplished so much in your life for somebody who has experienced trauma and find themselves flattened in some yeah. way they don't have that go go get it kind of spirit. What can you say to them that could be helpful? Well, I think that the quiet compassion that we can have for ourselves is really necessary. Like I think the perseverance in me that you one might see on overt levels, like, oh, then you went to medical school, or like you did like there are things you could check boxes of and say that sounds like perseverance. Is, is not really what helped me the most. I mean, I think it was helpful to me because it came through the lens of me, right? But I think it was the, the internal stuff, right, of, of being perseverant enough to, to, to think about myself in a different way when, when it was, in a sense, easier to just keep thinking bad things, right? And, and it's this sort of quiet compassion that we can all have. Right. The idea of like you people talk about comfort food, right? Like how about some just comfort, a comfort environment, right? Like, like sit in a, in a comfortable place and clothes that feel comfortable. Eat something you like. Be nice to yourself. Sit down with a cup of tea. Right. And, and, and think about what's what's going on inside of me. Right. What are the what are these basic principles that I'm thinking about myself? And and is there a way that I could be nicer? What would I say to someone else? I mean, it's an age old trick in mental health because it works, right? If, what would I say to someone else in this position? Why can I not say that to me? Is it really true that I can't say that to me? Or oh, you're hopeless because of what? Would I say that to somebody else, right? And it's really the perseverance. It's the quiet ways in which, you know, the good qualities in all of us come to the fore that I think really help us along the most. And, and we should be able to muster within ourselves the compassion that we can muster for other people. And, and most of us can do that far, far better for others than for ourselves. Now, you, you've worked with all kinds of clients and um, many, 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 many different people. When people have this breakthrough and they start treating themselves with this quiet compassion, what has happened? What has happened in your exchange with them? What has happened that that breakthrough actually happens and works there, there comes a time when a person sees that in one in one way or another the person sees you know i'm persecuting myself right and and i'm sick of that right i don't want to do that anymore right somebody maybe when i was growing up told me i was worthless right over and over again maybe that person's not even alive anymore but guess who's saying it to me now i am Right. And there's no that's this idea that there's no internal victim without an internal persecutor. Right. And what I mean is like we can be victimized by things. You know, someone, you know, someone attacks us. We are legally we be a victim. Right. But that's a difference between internalizing. Well, now 
I've decided that I'm just a victim of life or fate. Nothing ever goes well for me. No one will ever love me. I'll never be happy. Those are broad statements, right? And then there can be a realization. That's often the sort of magic moment, or it's not always a moment. Sometimes it evolves over time, and then you see that it's happened. But the person realizes, like, no, I'm not, nothing's foretold about me. You know, that when it's not foretold, my next relationship is going to be abusive because my last five were. Oftentimes the last five were because the person recreated the first abusive relationship in the other four, trying to gain some sense of mastery and safety, right? So the realization, I can be un, I can un, I can unattach myself from all of this, right? I do not need to see myself through this victim light where like nothing's going to be okay for me. And then when I'm kicking that out of me, what I'm also kicking out of me is the persecutor, right? And that's when a person can see, you know, things can be different. I'm going to think about them differently. I'm going to strategize about them differently. I'm going to go stepwise and carefully. And that's when you see the person who came in saying, I have people say exactly this. There's no way you're ever going to help me, right? All of my relationships are abusive and they always will be. Look, my last seven were abusive. And I'll say back something like, if you tell me that you've had seven completely different abusive relationships, I, I, maybe I'll agree with you, but you're not going to tell me that, right? And then they basically say something that gets recreated from trauma, right? Maybe they're trying to please somebody because it's what they learned when they were a child and they pick someone who's unhealthy and, and they see, oh, there's a pattern. I didn't do the, the same thing. I, I didn't do the, a different thing each time. It's the same thing over and over again. And I can understand and control that. And that's when you see that next relationship is different, right? And it applies to all the things that trauma tell, it gives us, makes blinders on us, and it gets us stuck into ruts of unhealthy patterns. And then we think we'll never get out of those ruts because we cite the circular evidence. I can't get out of it because I'm in it, right? But that's not true. And that's when people have, at times, like amazing changes. This isn't like, it's not a miracle. Because it all makes sense. It makes sense why the problem is there, and it makes sense how we get out of it. Miracles aren't good because you don't know if they're going to happen, right? What's good is I can learn and understand and do something and make change. And I absolutely see that all the time. You know, Paul, I could tell from reading the book that I was going to enjoy talking with you. I could tell. And I thought, you. obviously, Paul's really warm and he's Thank built you. relationships and rapport with all kinds of people. I know that he and I will be able to connect and uh, have a good rapport. And I was curious from your perspective, how you do it on the inside. I mean, you're working with patients who highly traumatized, many of them, and you write stories about them in trauma, the invisible epidemic. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want your help. They're not interested in you. They see you as some kind of intervening, whatever, guy in a white lab coat kind of thing. Leave me mm -hmm. alone. Don't shove that medicine in me, whatever. How do you do it? What's happening on the inside such that you're able to create such a relationship with so many different kinds of people? Well, I think the answer to that and the answer I've seen anytime I think someone, a person really can connect well with other people is it's the humility to see that we're just all in it together, right? And to just be a regular person, right? Like we all have our roles and we all have our successes and failures and things we're proud of and things we're not proud of. But ultimately, if we meet people where they're at and, and maybe there is a silver lining of the, some of the traumas in my own life. Which, which really came more in the second part of my life at a sequence of, of very significant traumas. And you know, maybe it, it, it helped me to see that, hey, we're all in it together, right? So if I have a white coat on and some medical knowledge, what, I'm incredibly lucky, right? Now, yes, I've worked hard, but like it doesn't matter how hard you work if you don't have the good fortune to be in a place where people will love and support and nurture you. And now you have the opportunity to learn something. Right. So use that thing to help people and, and, and realize that you can learn back from them. You don't know everything and and have the humility to just sit with people. Right. And that's what I saw when I think about, as you said that to me, I was picturing in my head some of the mentors when I was in training. And I could see them in their roles. Like some of them were very powerful people in the field and I could see them in their roles. But then when I saw them with patients, they, they were always humble. 
it was always a humility of like, I'm another person. I'm here to try and understand something and help you. And that's why they were able to be effective, right? Because in a sense, their own trauma, whatever their traumas may have been, didn't get them to a point where they had to say, hey, to feel good about myself, I got to feel better than other people, right? And there's a lot of that, right? Stratified by any power, whether it's wealth or it's political power or it's having a white coat on when somebody else doesn't, right? But when people don't need to do that, and that's true in medical system, and it's true just across the board, when you say, I don't need you to feel worse for me to feel better about myself, that, that's what lets people connect with other people, because you can be real with them. You're not hiding behind anything. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I'm curious about is when people start to self-reflect and self-inquire the way we've been talking about here, and they start to identify, yeah, this is an area of my life where I've been traumatized. Yes, I have shame about it. And they even get to know what triggers their trauma. And these are the things that trigger it. What have you learned and seen helps the people you work with when they're in the presence of a trauma trigger? Sure. There are a lot of strategies people can employ, and they can be very basic, even in a physical sense of, of like grounding oneself to solid things around one, right? Slow measured breathing, right? Where we fill our lungs with air and we let the air come back out, right? The things that we can do to feel a better sense of groundedness to the situation that we're in. So it tells our brain, this is now, this is not then, right? So we get to live in the present because the, the part of the brain that most matters, that limbic or emotional part of the brain does not care about the clock and the calendar, right? So if I was traumatized by someone who looked a certain way and was wearing a certain, you know, dressed a certain way, and now I see someone like that, my brain says now is then and that's going to happen again, right? But if I can ground myself to the present, and sometimes that's in thought and sometimes that's in body, then, then I, can, I can change that and I can change it so that I'm aware that I'm in the present and I'm not unsafe, right? Just because I'm not unsafe, just because I've been triggered to, to, to feel something in the past now again in the present. And, and that's when the person can then have greater control over their thoughts. Now is not then, I am in a safe place. Right. Just because someone else who looked like this hurt me doesn't mean this person is going to hurt me. Look how different things are. Look how far I've come. People can people can then ground themselves. We all can. Right. To the to, to the, the truth of the present instead of the basically the terror of the past. OK. And what about a, a situation where the trauma is associated with a tremendous amount of grief. And you've mentioned that a couple of times in our conversation, that sometimes for people it can be the death of someone close to them that can be the source of a major trauma in their life. Processing a grief for many of us is just excruciatingly terrible. It's just terrible. It's just terrible. How do we do it? Well, I think there's a, there's a pretty concrete answer to that. It is we separate grief from all the things that almost always come along with it, but aren't about grief. In order for grief to be processed, felt, addressed, made better, right? Grief has to have a level playing field without a whole bunch of other problems in it, right? And often when people are grieving, they're trying to grieve when they're feeling guilty. They're trying to grieve when they're feeling angry. They're trying to grieve when they're feeling ashamed. And then they cannot grieve. And then the grief becomes complicated because now the grief exists over time. And now it's colored by the shame or the anger, right? Or, or the sense of responsibility, right? That, 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 that came along with the loss. And if we can parse those things out, right? In a way that we, we talk about, okay, you're angry, right? You're, you're ashamed. You feel responsible. You feel guilty. We talk about those things so that we can put them in their place because those, those are not about, those things are not about grief. And if you can put those things in their place and the person can be left with what actually makes sense to be there, which is grief. And then we can talk about sadness, loss. The person can cry, right? Because we often need to cry. It's the best defense we've got, right? It doesn't hurt anybody, but boy, it sure pays down the distress inside of us. And then we can actually grieve when people say, oh, I've been months or years and, and my grief is the same. That's because the grief has been blocked and there's been no opportunity to pay down that grief. Mm -hmm. 
That's really, really helpful. Uh, I think that process of separation, untangling that you're describing, that's um, that's very insightful that we need to do that. It's, it's almost like, th- thank you. And it's almost like, you know, imagine someone just put a gigantic vat of something toxic, right? You know, behind your home, right? And look, I, I want that to go away, right? But the, but the very fact that it's put there, right, pre- then prevents you from being able to do anything about it, right? Being able to drain it out or get help, right? Now it's there and its very presence prevents you from doing something about it. And that's often how grief and shame comes, right? I mean, the, the grief is something bad has happened. There's now something toxic that we have to we have to cry, we have to be sad about it. We have to we have to you know feel close to good people around us. We have to do something about it, or it's going to hurt us, right? But the shame that comes along with us prevents us from doing anything about it, from getting rid of it a gallon at a time, right? Or from doing something to dilute it, and it's and it's not as bad anymore. Even the passage of time, right, doesn't make things better if we're still living in the immediacy. Of, of, of the event that caused the grief in the first place. So if we're fighting shame and everything that comes along with it, there's no amount of grief that we can't, even though it's painful, and I'm not making light of that pain, but there's no amount of grief that a person who, who's looking at that grief and has good support systems around them can't get through. But if there's a bunch of guards Right, making sure you never actually get at it, like shame and all the other accomplices of shame. That that's when the grief gets worse. It gets complicated, and and sometimes it gets so complicated with depression or anxiety or substances that the person doesn't survive the grief. And I think that's among the greatest of tragedies because it absolutely doesn't have to be that way. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the the sections of your new book uh, that I thought was really interesting, and I I hadn't really considered all of these implications. It's a section of the book called How Trauma Changes the Map. And you write about how trauma changes how we think, our physiology, there can be chronic pain, inflammation, etc. that come in the wake of trauma. And I'd love to hear more uh, what you see when you say Trauma changes the map. How does it do that? Because it can change inside of us what we believe about ourselves and the world without us knowing it, right? That is, to, to me, that is is a perfect, um, it, it maps perfectly to the idea of actually having a map that you knew and understood that said where you wanted to go and how you wanted to be and safe ways to get there that gets changed and you don't know it, right? So now you see dangers where there aren't, where there aren't dangers. You see it's safer to just stay home and do nothing, right? Because look at the map just shows nothing but frightening things around us. And we don't know how to navigate anymore. Parts of the map now are, you know, they're washed out or they're colored over. And it tells us that we can't, we can't gain a grasp on ourselves and our lives and navigate ourselves forward. And that's really terrifying, right? It changes, it truly changes everything. And and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say most of what I treat, right, comes from trauma. And, and that I hear said by general medical doctors as well, right? Trauma predisposes to Depression. Depression predisposes to cardiovascular disease, right? Which predisposes to heart attacks and heart failure and strokes, right? And and trauma can overactivate the immune system. And now we're predisposing to all sorts of autoimmune diseases, right? That people can get. And it saps us of energy and of vitality and it impacts our sleep. So and, and it exacerbates and accentuates pain signaling, right? So so a person can feel like they are miserable, they're depressed. And they're 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 in pain all the time, and they don't feel like they know what to do or where to go, and they don't actually realize that all of that is developed after trauma, and they don't even know it because the brain can't see back to what they thought and felt before trauma. Because why? What are they referencing? They're referencing their map, and the map is now different. So they're referencing like that's the way it is, that's the way it always was, and they don't realize no, no, trauma came in and changed that map. And that's why we have to anchor ourselves to what we thought and knew about ourselves, make a a life narrative. What were things like when I was younger? What did I feel about myself before certain traumatic things happened? If I'm not aware that traumatic things happen, let me think about that. 
Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, right? I'm not saying everybody has some giant thing they don't know about. But, but as your experience was when you were reading the book, right, is not uncommon. And even in, in just discussions with people that we start to realize, like, right, there's trauma in us. And, and the trauma that we don't acknowledge is often not small trauma. It's not like, oh, I didn't get picked for the team once. It's often deaths of people, assaults, discrimination. It, it, it's, it's really big things that we're not aware of. But if we look and see that they're there, well, now we can, we can start with, that's not the map I started off with. And you know what I want to get back to? I want to get back to the original map because that was true and accurate, right? It wasn't changed by trauma to, to, to make me think that I can't navigate myself forward and the world won't let me do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you made this interesting comment that it's possible to inherit trauma from our family line uh, and even not even know the traumas could have happened before we were even conceived. So as we're tracing back and looking for the trauma that might be invisible underneath, how do you suggest we engage in that kind of activity when we're looking at inherited trauma? Looking at a family constellation, you know, we, I think, especially in America now, we're so focused on like, well, who I am and where I came from is maybe that's even the last place I lived, right? Like we're not thinking anchored to generations, right? But when we do that, it it, it elucidates so much about us. And, And that is psychological in many ways, but it's biological as well, right? So, so understanding say that previous generation suffered through trauma you see this in the second world war right where it was thought oh people who went through the holocaust that their, their children were more anxious and the thought was well because they were probably more anxious people when they were parenting right because of what they went through right we realize like that there's often truth to that but also that trauma changed what through what's called epigenetics which is like our genes are not just our genes, right? But whether our genes are manifest in us, right? Whether they they do things that 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 impact us, right? Can shift according to trauma, right? So now we know that the genetic expression in an offspring can be changed by trauma that happened years ago, and that the children of Holocaust survivors at times were having mental health issues, including around anxiety, in ways that was part psychological, but also part coming from the direct impact of trauma on parents that would experience that trauma perhaps years before they were born. So when we when we embed ourselves in 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 our own history, right, and the meaning of that history in in the families and the social systems that we come from, then we get an accurate picture of ourselves. Mm-hmm. A much more accurate picture than if I just think, well, I'm me as I'm sitting here, but like it's not actually true. Right. Because a trauma that came before I was even conceived, right, impacts me in some way, which again isn't an excuse for not taking care of myself. Right. But it can certainly help me understand if I'm lamenting, my God, why am I so anxious all the time? You know, I think, well, you know, look, that's the hand I was dealt. And some of that is, is literally a historical hand. Right. So I don't want to say, well, that's because like there's something wrong with me. Right. But because like, look, that's the historical and, and biological hand I've been dealt. Now, now, now I don't feel so ashamed about it. And I can think, well, what can I do about it? Because I do want to understand it so I can do something about it. And this is all about change. Like I may be talking about theoretical things sometimes, but the book is all about gra- being grounded to the practical. Like if I can understand these things, I can do something about it now for myself, for the people around me and the communities that I live in. So I just want to check this out to see if I'm tracking with you accurately. When you look at someone and their reporting, self-report is anxiety, depression, or a lot of the other things that people bring to a psychiatrist. Through your lens, you would get curious. I wonder what the traumas might be underneath this. I'm curious about that. Is that correct? Is that fair to say that? Yeah, I think it's, yes, it's fair to say that I'm absolutely curious because if you come to me and say you're depressed, I want to know why, right? Now, maybe here's one example. Maybe it's because your thyroid is is not functioning well, right? That's not trauma, right? But that could be why you're depressed, right? So I don't want to say, oh, you're depressed. Let me give you an antidepressant. I want to say you're depressed. Why? Right. I want to make sure there's not a tumor somewhere. 
that spinning off molecules that make you depressed. Or there's not a thyroid problem that we could easily fix with a thyroid medicine. But as part of that, where does that curiosity often lead? Most of the time, where that leads to is to talking about trauma. And I discovered that because as a curious person, every now and then I'll find somebody who has low thyroid, right? If they're depressed, what do I find most of the time, no matter what it is that a person is presenting with when I'm curious why? Because if I don't understand why, what am I doing, right? I'm just a vending machine of medicine if I don't try and understand why, right? Where that answer is led to again and again and again is trauma. And sometimes that's true about purely physical things. Someone gets sent to me for pain, they have terrible shoulder pain. No one knows why. Four orthopedic surgeons have seen them. So often the answer is trauma, even when it seems like, oh, it's purely physical. Mm -hmm. Now, something I wanted to ask you about, Paul, one of the unusual features of your new book, Trauma, The Invisible Epidemic, How Trauma Works and How We Can Heal From It, is that there's a foreword to the book by Lady Gaga. And I have to say, uh, for me and for the folks, it sounds true. This is a really big deal. Uh, th th Thank this you. is a moment in time to have a book published by Sounds True that has a foreword by Lady Gaga. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about uh, your relationship with her and how she came to write the foreword for the book. Sure. sure. You know, I'm fortunate to, to meet people from all different walks of life, right? And one of the things that I have found is, gosh, when you when you really, when push comes to shove, we are so similar in the things that make us suffer and in how we suffer. And that, as, as she wrote in the foreword to the book, is the basis for our meeting, that she was in a place of suffering. And that suffering was through the human lens, right, of what that was like for her and through traumatic things that promoted along that suffering. So in one sense, the experience has been similar because we're both human beings and we both have trauma and I'm in a place where I know some things and I can then be helpful to her. So there's an element of it that's just the shared humanness, right? There's also a way in which she's an exceptionally kind and insightful person who very much wants to do good in the world around her and then is, is interested in spreading the word about trauma. So instead of saying, I don't, want to acknowledge that I've had trauma, like, like a lot of us do, right? Of, of saying, no, I'm okay with acknowledging this. It's part of the shared humanness with, between me and other people. And, and, and I think that's what led her to be willing to write a foreword that, that speaks to, to, to the trauma that she's had in her own life and how having someone that presumably has some knowledge and ability that, that can be a real human with her and where to trust and rapport can be built has, has made a difference to her. And that is unique in a sense, because we're all unique, because some of that is unique to her, but, but it's also like that's the way that we're helped, including how she's helping people, right? She's helping people by sharing, I, like you, have trauma, right? And just the same way I might say, I have trauma, like you, just because I have a white coat on, and just because she is who she is in the world, doesn't mean that we're immune from any of this, right? And, and by being open about that, well, guess what? We can each get help ourselves, and, and it opens up the window to help other people. And it's something we've allied around because I think we both have a desire to use, utilize some of the difficult things that may have happened to us to, to help make other people's lives better if we can. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she says in the foreword uh, that you were instrumental in uh, saving her life, really. I mean, it's a powerful statement that she makes. And what comes up for me, uh, you mentioned, I said, what helped you? with your trauma. Yes. And you said other people. And when I looked into my own experience, I thought to myself, other people, the kindness, the generosity, the love, the goodness, the compassion of other people. And what I'm wondering here as we bring our, our conversation towards the end is if we want to be a healing resource in the lives of other people in our world who have experienced trauma in one way or another, who share with us their shame about something that's happened in their life, something that's traumatic. What would you advise us so that we can be a healing resource for other people? In the social climate that we're in, I would focus on being aware of what is going on inside of us 
that blocks us from connection with other people, right? So there's a lot, um, there's a lot going on in our country today, and I think in the world today that that that, that kind of goes like this: like, hey, if you're not just like me, or if you don't believe what I believe, then you're bad, right? And I don't want you anywhere near me, and now I'm angry with you, right? And what this does is it separates people, right? As people don't have a sense of safety in talking about whatever it is may have happened to them, whether it's because they're worried about being assailed or because their back is so against the wall with, I have to be as strong and powerful as I can because like everyone's fighting for everything now. And we see so much of this with some of the ways in which social media has run rampant, right? There are ways in which it's helpful. There are ways in which it becomes a route to the, you know, the loudest, most aggressive, most polarizing opinions, right? Really informing people's thoughts. And then there's no room for even basic facts, right? Like, can we, if we disagree, can we assess if, if, if you and I think the same things are true, right? Like that would be a good place to start, right? If we can't even do that, then we become so polarized and isolated that no one, including people who are being the aggressors at times, right, feel any sense of safety to look at what's inside of them. And I would say if a, if a person is if a, if a person is angry, if a person is frustrated, if a person is blaming, if a person is looking at whole demographics of society and, and identifying demographics of society as problems, right, saying, like, what's coming from me? Right, that I, I feel something in myself. I, I feel the need to do this, to never be wrong, or to to never tolerate one degree of difference from what my my reflex response is to something. We're breeding this in society in a way that makes us more and more and more isolated, right? And what we need is something different from that, right? We need to feel like, hey, if we're not exactly the same. We can be in the same room together and we don't have to have a, a reflexive feeling of fear and insecurity, right? We've got to start changing on a societal level of how are we approaching the world and how are we approaching other people, right? Because this hasn't really gone in the best direction over the last several years. And it runs risk that we get so we all get more and more and more and more isolated in our own trauma, which gets worse and worse and spins up and spins up and that we blow ourselves apart. And, and that's not an unrealistic thing to think. I don't think I'm catastrophizing when I think, could that bring down the nation? I, absolutely, I think it can. And, and if that happens, sure, that's a societal phenomenon, but that will become, that will, if it happens, it would happen because on an individual level, we can't even feel some basic safety and connection with each other anymore. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Paul, I want to uh, end our conversation on the note that you actually end the book on. And you write here at the end of the book, you circle back to the introduction and you say, in the introduction, I wrote the diversity of human problems I've witnessed in my life and career is nearly infinite. That being said, one reason stands out for the vast majority of these problems. The underlying reason is trauma. I still think this is an incredibly hopeful statement because having one reason to address makes our task obvious and straightforward. We must address trauma. So let's say that the listener now agrees with you and they say, okay, we must address trauma. This one reason it's underneath so much of our reactivity, et cetera. What is Dr. Paul Conti's manifesto, if you will, on how we're going to do that, even if we could agree on that. How, how are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are very, very practical and even common sense routes to it. So I, I set out five goals, right, in that last part of the book that I think, again, are, are very commonsensical, right? Of how, so let's consider ourselves and others with compassion like why can't we start from a place if i'm if i'm talking thinking about my own tribulations or disappointments or if i'm thinking about someone else right can we make choices to act without harming other people right can we make choices to learn how to be different in the world how to think about the facts of the world around us the feelings of other people right can we hold people accountable for truth right how much goes on in the world where we know that it's being driven by something that's not true but we tolerate it 
right? There's some basic principles here that anchor back to our religious traditions, right? Our religious traditions tell us some very basic concepts about honesty, openness, acceptance, which fit, by the way, with, I think, the lessons of history, right? It fits with even early education. Like, what would I have done in kindergarten is often not a bad question to ask, right? If we ground ourselves to these basic foundations and these basic goals, which in many ways are very commonsensical, right? But we're very far away from them, which is why I, I do feel hopeful that like we can ground to these things. I'm not saying we got to get ourselves to Mars in order to be okay. Like, how about we go back to some of the principles of, of the major religious traditions, right? And early childhood education, right? It's not that hard then to gain knowledge and, and we can use that knowledge for good and we start making healing and hope. Like I see this happening. It's not theoretical, right? I see this happening in people and in situations that I have the privilege to be involved in and they can happen on broader levels too, but we have to ground ourselves back to some of what actually makes sense instead of being off in a place that really ends up being driven by trauma and anger and aggression and denial and, and all of these things that, that I think we've seen really grow, certainly over the last couple of years in this country. And it just doesn't have to be like that. And it's not that hard, but we've got to have the wherewithal. We have to, we have, to have the insight to see like, hey, let's back away from some of this and ground to some of these basic things. I've been speaking with Dr. Paul Conti. He's written a new illuminating book. It's called Trauma, The Invisible Epidemic, How Trauma Works and How We Can Heal It. Uh, and I find you personally just such an inspiring and heart-based person. I just want to thank you so much for all your great work, Paul. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at soundstrue.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together, I believe, we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com, waking up the world 